Hello, I'm Rebecca Lewington, and welcome to our podcast. I'm here with Bill Philippak, Distinguished Member of Technical Staff in Micron's Custom Engineering Lab organization. He's rolling out a new tool which lets customers test and qualify memory chips in their designs faster and better than ever before. Now, better and faster is always a good excuse for conversation. So, Bill, thanks very much for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. First, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your background and what's your current role? Yeah, okay. So I graduated from the University of Michigan in 2006, and I was lucky enough to get a job with Micron right out of college. Uh, so I moved out to headquarters in Boise, Idaho, and I started in the NAND product development team. Um, and I stayed there for 13 years, which sounds like a really long time. Um, but I would say every year my job responsibilities changed in some way. I was lucky enough to always be on the cutting edge of NAND technology, trying to do things that competitors hadn't done, the industry hadn't done. So it was pretty exciting, a lot of room for innovation, and, and I did that for a long time. Um, about a year and a half ago, I moved to the Customer Engineering Labs team. We have 13 labs across the globe, and we're trying to provide uh, technical capabilities and expertise to our local customers. One of those labs happens to be in Detroit, Michigan, which if you can think about where I went to school, that's a convenient location for me. Um, so I moved out here and very automotive focused given the area, but you know, providing the expertise to local customers here, still get to contribute at a high level for Micron and get to learn about how our memory is used in real systems. That's brilliant. So you've kind of moved a step in the value chain from making the devices to helping people use the devices. Exactly, yep. So let's talk a little bit about timing and signal analysis. What is it and why do customers need it? Okay, yeah, so um, to really understand timing and signal analysis, and I'm gonna call it a TSA throughout this discussion. TSA, as you know, Micron loves acronyms. So that's our acronym for timing and signal analysis. Um, to really understand what it is, you have to think about kind of what our customers are doing and what their role is. Every customer is different, but typically, our customers are buying our memory devices and they're piecing together that with a memory controller, passives, other chips and so on into a whole system. And they're sort of the integrators. They're designing the PCB, but they're not the ones making the memory, of course. They're not making the memory controller. They don't own all the pieces. So what I'd say a TSA is, is when a customer comes to us and says, did I do this right? And what that means for us is, am I operating the memory device the way I'm supposed to be operating it? Meaning, am I sending the right commands? Am I treating it the way I'm supposed to? And another big part of it, of course, is signal integrity. So am I delivering signals to that memory device in a way that's going to have margin and going to operate properly for the system? Awesome. So our timing and signal analysis is us trying to measure those things for a customer and making sure that it's going to operate correctly. So, you know, you might think, why doesn't the customer measure it themselves? And, and some do. Um, but, you know, there's two main reasons for that. One is, of course, we're the memory experts, so we know what matters. We're going to be able to look at that and, and decide if there's proper margins and if that's going to work across the usage condition. But the other part that we're going to talk about a lot today is that measuring these things is not as straightforward as it sounds. It, it's a challenge to be able to measure high-speed signaling you know, in a way that's accurate and trustworthy. And, and that's another reason our customers come to us for that kind of analysis. Excellent. Got it. Now, um, TSA is kind of an unfortunate acronym, at least in the United States. Are you required to remove your shoes before you do it? <laughs> I'm, yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. You don't know <laughs> that. I'm sorry. Um, so how is TSA traditionally done? Yeah. So if you thought about it for a second on how you might do as a, what I described, it, our traditional way of doing it is exactly what you think of first, which is physical measurements. So we're talking about trying to put some sort of test equipment on that memory interface and directly measuring the signaling, directly measuring the protocol and trying to figure out what's going on. So if I can describe that quickly here on a customer system, that would mean we actually have to remove the memory device from the PCB. Then we have to insert something in between the memory device and the PCB to allow us to measure it. So we insert an interposer that provides us with some small stubs and pads that allow us to connect probes in between that PCB and the, and the memory device so that we can measure it. And then of course, we're gonna probe signals and we're gonna measure them on high speed logic analyzers and oscilloscopes. And you know, I talked about why customers don't do this themselves. I mean, we're not talking about using an oscilloscope you can buy from Amazon for a few hundred dollars. These are very high tech, 
scopes that can measure very high speed signals because that's how our, how fast our memory interface is running. Right, so, you're talking about nanoseconds, or milliseconds, or microseconds. Yeah, even yeah. down to picoseconds. So it, it's very, very fast, and and it takes a lot of work, and and we have to be very careful to make sure we're measuring the signals properly. So of course, you know, this is kind of the brain dead way of doing the measurements, and it and it makes sense, and it's conceptually simple, um, but it's very slow, um, and and time consuming to be able to do this. Right, which brings us to your new approach, which is quite different. Can you tell us something about that? First, what's it called? Yeah, so our, our new approach is called VTSA to sort of add to the alphabet soup of acronyms. Um, <laughs> the V in this case stands for virtual and, and sometimes it's a little confusing because virtual can sound like simulation. And in this case, that's not what's going on. Um, so let me kind of describe where it came from and, and we'll talk about what it is. So um, we really know that we need to change our approach going forward. So as I mentioned, the, the physical measurements is, is a way that, that has worked for us in the past. It's been trustworthy, but as our interface speeds go faster and faster, we run into some problems. Um, one of those problems is called the observer effect. And, and basically what that means is just by trying to look at the signals, you're actually influencing the signals themselves. And, and it becomes a bigger deal the faster you go. I, I think one of the best examples I've seen is um, when you try to measure tire pressure. So, you know, the traditional way of doing that anyway is you let a little air out to measure the, the tire pressure, right? And you're actually influencing how much air is in your tire by, by doing the measurement. And the less air you have, the more you might notice, right? Because you don't have a lot of extra air and, and you're gonna notice. Um, very similar here. We've got margins that are getting smaller and smaller, interfaces are going faster and faster. And you're trying to measure something with a probe that has parasitics, um, measure it with a scope, all of that's going to influence the signaling in some way. And if it's going slow enough, you might not notice or it might not be a big deal. But as we go faster, it becomes an issue where we're not even sure what we're measuring is what's really going on. And we might draw the wrong conclusions, right? We might say there's margin or there's no margin uh, when that really isn't the case. Um, so what a VTSA does is it tries to let the system itself take the measurements instead of measuring with test equipment. So in this case, that would be basically having the memory controller measure the interface uh, through some modes that it already has. And, and it gets a little complicated, but the basic idea is to operate at high speeds like we're doing today, it's already a requirement of memory controllers to be able to sweep some parameters like signal delivery timings, uh, reference voltages that are used for the input buffers and so on. And you can utilize those sweeps to actually characterize how big the data eyes are, which is most of what we're measuring when we're doing physical analysis in the first place. Uh, so, what's a data eye? Yeah, so a data eye, if you kind of look at uh, a signal across a PCB, you've got your uh, signal rising and signal falling. And, and what a data eye is trying to do is characterize sort of how big that opening is that you have to, to determine whether a signal is a one or zero. So if the signal, I, if the eye is very wide, very open, that means that you have a lot of room in terms of the reference voltage to use and the time that you can use to strobe that signal and determine the one and zero properly. Okay. If it's very closed, then you don't have a lot of margin to be able to do that. And that's where signaling issues come from. Right, okay. So, you know, using these modes that are sort of already available, we can actually characterize the data eyes themselves. And that work is being done because a, a controller is, forced today on very high speed interfaces to find the sweet spots to operate the device in, in the way I just described, you know, pick the right references, pick the right signal delivery. But today, before VTSA, that information is really thrown away. They go and do this characterization, but then they throw the data away because they figured out what the sweet spot is. What a VTSA does is basically says, okay, let's find a way to go get that information as characterization and let's analyze it offline to then be able to determine how much margin we have, just like we're doing with physical measurements. Right, that's rather brilliant. You're, 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 you're taking what is effectively a lab that already exists in the chip and letting it do your work for you. Brilliant. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, it, it benefits? Sounds, yeah, that's what I was gonna go into. It sounds conceptually simple, but you know, the benefits are, are really big. One, as I mentioned, physical measurements are time consuming and, and very difficult to do. Uh, across the entire memory interface or picture a system that's got 120 DRAM devices or something, right? You're certainly not gonna measure every signal across every DRAM device. When you're talking about letting software do it and letting code do it, you can go do these measurements very, very fast. So we can turn 
you know, multiple weeks into a few minutes or hours in terms of, of runtime. So that's, that's a very nice benefit. Um, of course, I talked about the observer effect. It doesn't exist anymore in this case because I'm not attaching any test equipment at all. So, you know, really a requirement as we go forward and push our memory speeds faster. And then of course, just some of the obvious things like I don't have to remove the memory device. I don't have to solder anything. Um, I can measure now an entire DRAM uh, interface or maybe every DRAM on the, on the, on the system. Um, lots of benefits in terms of, of runtime and, and accuracy. Wow, so you're getting much better results and you're doing it much more quickly, which is great, but begs the question, why didn't we do this before? Yeah, <laughs> great question. Uh, again, seems kind of like an obvious solution, so it's a logical question. Um, what I do is maybe have you think about, you know, rewind 10 years and, and think about what you might choose 10 years ago. Um, at that point, interface speeds were certainly not as fast as they are today. Um, so the observer effect, though it always exists, is almost a non-issue at that point. Um, so, you know, when customers are coming to us at that point and asking us to do these measurements, everybody's more comfortable with, with the physical measurement, right? Because it's it's very direct. Again, it's it's kind of the brain dead approach. Um, it's it's a little more obvious in terms of what results you're getting and, and how to compare those. I think sometimes people shudder thinking about a piece of code that's operating and, and and going in and finding these margins and determining whether the system's going to have margin or not uh, and making decisions off that. I mean, you can envision having a code bug that adds a volt of margin to every number at the end and, and you now feel very comfortable and, and it would just be because of a code bug, code bug. So, you know, I think those are the reasons things started with the physical methodology um, and people won't change something like that until they're forced to. Uh, you know, of course, we have some more progressive uh, systems and customers and so on that are more interested in, in some of the other benefits I talked about. But in general, um, we're really just being forced into it now because the interfaces are going so fast that we're not going to be able to reliably measure them anymore anyway. Right, right. So what what innovations were necessary to make this work and whose idea was it? Yeah, good, good question. I think maybe there's some dispute on who invented it. Uh, and I think that's because as I mentioned, some of these capabilities have been built into memory controllers and systems for some time just to enable the interface in the first place. Um, so you can imagine some controller vendors may have had ways to analyze pieces and parts of, of this data. Um, I think Scott Emmer, who leads the customer engineering labs team, had the idea in a broader sense in terms of replacing the things that we're doing with the physical measurements with this BTSA approach, because it does require a more holistic view. And making sure that we include all the modes and all the all the data analysis that's required to really uh, take a look at the entire interface and all the things we care about. Um, in terms of innovation, you know, again, I, I think conceptually the, it's it's rather simple to leverage the modes that are already there. But I think that's the biggest innovation is all the training modes that are really required to be able to optimize from the memory controller side in the first place. Um, so, you know, Micron has been providing modes like that as our interfaces go faster. Um, you know, we're providing new modes all the time that basically allow the memory controller to do these sweeps without interacting with the array um, and getting results very, very fast so they can tune themselves. I, I think that's really at the core of all of this. Um, outside of that, though, of course, working closely with our memory controller vendors um, individually to sort of understand how to collect the data, what the tools look like. Um, there's a fair amount of work there that, that has to be right. done. Right. And that's a good point. It's been a very, it sounds like it's been a very collaborative process, which, which yeah, brings me to my next question. Um, what do customers have to do to do use this? Can they do it themselves? Can any PCB be used? What has to happen before you can do a VTSA? Yeah, it, it sort of differs by implementation to some degree. And, you know, I, I want to make something clear and hopefully it is already, but Micron is not the manufacturer of memory controllers. So as you mentioned, it, it's a very collaborative effort with the memory controller vendors. We have to work with them to make sure this kind of thing is enabled and works the way it's supposed to work in the first place. But of course they have some freedom of implementation, right? So every implementation is not gonna be exactly the same. Um, but in general, what it looks like would be something like serial port access on the system. Um, so a customer would design that in and that would allow us to dump new code to the memory controller that then would run basically the training routines it already has, but you know something writing over the top that then takes that information, stores it somewhere and, and outputs it over the serial port so you can get it back to your computer. 
um, and then you know various tools to go in and analyze and plot that data and, and things like that. Um, right. So it, it differs a little bit, but in general, that that's the idea. Um, but you hit the nail on the head. I think one of the big values I haven't talked about yet is technically anyone can run uh, this tool and and look at the results, which. Again, some customers may be able to do that today on physical measurements, but they really have to have the equipment and have to have some expertise to be able to do that. This is much more straightforward. It's a piece of code. They can run it and take a look at their margins. And often our customers are running PCB simulation to try to look at data I openings and so on themselves in the first place. So this is a great tool to allow them to run something on hardware and compare to their simulation. Right, right. So you would probably say to your customers, call your chipset vendor today and demand this is built into it. Absolutely. And, and you know, again, it's getting more important as we go faster, because at some point we can reach a reach a stage where we don't believe the physical measurements that we're getting. So it's, it's right. very important to have the capability on our you know, next gen memory. We're not quite to the quantum point yet where observing it completely destroys it. But uh, getting we're getting... <laughs> yes, yes. So how's the response been from your customers? Yeah, I, I think we're still building momentum as we talked about. Um, obviously, response has been positive in the cases where we've used it. We've done a fair amount of proof of physical versus uh, this virtual TSA methodology to prove that it's providing either the same results or in some cases, more accurate results. We have seen the observer effect, of course, um, and, and we can demonstrate that. Um, and, and that's been helpful to be able to show customers that. And then of course, um, the fact that we can measure the whole memory interface and, and all the, the memory devices on, on board has been a very positive thing. Um, so that's been great. And then of course, response from customers in being able to run it themselves and analyze some of the stuff themselves has been a, a very high point for them. Uh, and then turn time. I mean, we really are talking about a few hours or days to be able to take a look at this kind of thing compared to the physical measurements, which I'll say is multiple weeks at best. Right. I mean, something's this compelling. Once you see it, you're going to want it. Oh, I, I yes. get it. So just to finish off, um, what's next for you, Bill? Yeah, I, I think in this arena, um, I think there's a fair amount of work that we're going to be doing to make sure that our chips have vendors are including this in, in their next gen chips that support our memory. Um, and then we're still going to be doing a fair amount of proving physical versus this virtual TSA methodology for customers and making sure we build confidence um, with everyone out there to make sure that everybody is comfortable with this methodology moving forward. Um, so that's, that's going to be a big part of the, I'll say, short to medium term. Um, I think a little longer term, you know, there's more innovation to be had in terms of trying to find new training algorithms and, and new methodologies between the uh, memory controller and the memory device to test itself. And the more we can do along that front, the better, um, because it really means we don't have to introduce test equipment. It's great for debugging problems. Uh, it's gonna benefit everyone, especially as, as signal integrity gets tougher and tougher. So I think Mike has got a good hand in, in the innovation there, but we've got a partner with our customers and our, our memory controller vendors to, to continue in innovating along those lines. Excellent. Well, Bill, this has been a really interesting insight into all the complexity and all the collaboration that goes into making the consumer devices, well, all the devices that have PCBs in them that we take for granted every day, just what it takes to make them work and make them work reliably. So thank you very much for joining me. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me.